Welcome from the First Presbyterian Church in Burbank. We're glad you're here. Let's join the service now and hear the proclaiming of God's Word. If you have your Bibles, turn to John 15 with me, if you don't mind. We're going to continue what I was very blessed to start a few months ago as we looked at John 14, and we looked at how our faith and how life itself begins with God, begins with Christ as Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, if you can remember that a few weeks ago or a month ago. And then I was uh, blessed to come back and talk more about how that is continued with a response from us, and that response is obedience, that we are called to obedience, but we don't do that alone. We do that with the presence of the Holy Spirit that lives inside us and guides us to God's will in our life, the things that He has for us to do in this world And today, I'm very happy to continue that as we jump into chapter 15, as Jesus continues to talk about who he is and how that is connected to his will and how that is connected to, again, our obedience. And here we go, John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You already are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine, and neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If a person remains in me and I in him, then that person will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire, and they are burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be complete in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you, for greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have called, everything that I have learned from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. The word of the Lord. As we we enter this season of thanksgiving, the season of giving, it's appropriate that we jump back in to chapter 15 and get a deeper sense of what obedience is connected to Christ. In the Gospel of John, Jesus uses the phrase, I am, to both answer two things, questions concerning who he is and questions that describe or answers that describe his purposes. For who he is, Jesus would answer those who would say, are you Jesus of Nazareth? He would answer simply with, I am. Oftentimes, he would be asked, are you the Messiah? And sometimes he would say simply, I am. Jesus would also explain his death and his authority as the Son of God by simply saying, I am. Now, this phrase seems familiar to us. It's like we've heard it somewhere before. If you remember your your Sunday school and your Old Testament back in Exodus 3, Moses finds himself at the foot of Mount Horeb, where he encounters God in a burning bush. And God tells him to go back to Egypt. 
And he said, what? <laughs> I just came from Egypt to get out of Egypt. And he says, you must go back. You got to go back and you got to save my people. And so they go back and forth for a while and Moses finally says, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. But I need to know who's sending me. What's your name? Because I'm going to get there and you're going to do all this great stuff through me. But then the Israelites are going to ask, who sent you? And I want to know your name. And the Lord said, I am. That's his name. Yahweh is how you might say it in Hebrew. It's a verb that means I am. Sometimes we hear I am who I am is what we hear it meaning. Sometimes it's I will do what I will do. But either way, this is a verb that Jesus uses as an answer to these questions about who he is. And he causes a lot of controversy by using this name, I am. He also shows those who would listen who he is. Fourteen times he uses the phrase, the name, I am. Seven of those are these, answers to who he is. But the other seven describe his purposes. I am the bread of life, he says in chapter 6. I am the light of the world, chapter 8. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, chapter 10. I am the resurrection, chapter 11. You'll remember this one, I am the way, the truth, and the life, chapter 14. And here, finally, in 15, I am the true vine. These are the ways in which Jesus works in the world with regards to all of humanity. We are hungry. We can't see. We don't know where to go. We don't know who to follow. We can't begin again. We need direction. We need authenticity. We need existence. And we need to be connected to something. And Jesus says, I am all of these things. Look no further than me. During the last few chapters in John, Jesus has been moving physically towards the Garden of Gethsemane. He is on this long obedience towards the cross. He will meet his betrayal of his friend Judas in the garden. He will be arrested, and he will then walk that short uh, path to the cross from the garden. And it's during this movement that he prepares his disciples for the time when that long obedience is finished for him, but that long obedience begins for his disciples. And so we begin in chapter 15, verse 1, with Jesus saying, I am the true vine. Now, the vine is a, a classic example of sustainability. How many of you have ever been to a vineyard? You go to the vineyard to see the vine, right? No. <laughs> you go to the vineyard to drink the wine. But you can't drink the wine without fruit, and you can't have fruit without the vine. But the vine is what makes fruit possible. And I like this because this is consistency through the gospel, certainly the gospel of John. In John's, uh, th the third chapter of his gospel, uh, Jesus, in the first of many signs that would reveal his glory, turns water into wine at the wedding in Cana in chapter 3. And it's appropriate then that this final conversation that Jesus have, has with his disciples right before his death, he calls himself the true vine. If your vine is healthy, so will your branches and so will your fruit, and so will your wine. And so Jesus not only establishes that he is the vine, but the, he is the true vine. And being connected to that true vine will only produce, can only produce an abundance of fruit. But where I think this becomes real for us is in verse 2, where the reality of pruning, the reality of cleansing both the good and the bad branches comes into play. I think we would all agree that the idea of bearing fruit all the time, knowing what to do all the time, making the right choices all the time happens less frequently than we would like it to. Amen? That's the struggle with life. It's the struggle with faith that we will encounter until all things are made new. The kingdom of God is already here. Jesus established that. But it's not 
fully finished until Christ returns. And so we continue to live for Christ as new creations here in his kingdom, shedding our old lives of sin, living on the assured promises of God's grace, and at the same time continuing to struggle with sin. Because we know the evil one is still here trying to mess everything up for us. And so the reality of pruning, the, the reality of cleansing helps to keep us focused until that day when Christ reser- returns. In rabbinic Judaism, there is an idea that we are created pure and perfect, that our souls are created pure and perfect. In Judaism, our soul and our bodies are not separate. They are the same. They make up the whole of the person. And so in creation, a person is created pure and perfect. And so then, we must keep it that way. That's our responsibility to keep ourselves pure and perfect. But is that a reality? Can we actually do that? No. And that's where pruning and cleansing comes comes to play. In Leviticus 11 through 20, there are tons of rules concerning the cleansing of one's self, the cleansing of the community. If you sinned, you were taken out of the community so you could be clean, and you stayed for an amount of time, however long it was, and then you could come back in, being clean again so that you can continue <clears throat> in the community. That idea is carried over, I think, into Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. In chapter 5 in Matthew, where Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away because it's better for you to lose one member of your Self than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Pruning, cleansing happens when we confess our sins today. When we give up that part of our life that is corrupting our bodies, corrupting our minds, corrupting corrupting that perfect creation that we were meant to be. There are also times when God takes away good things in our lives. Now I'm meddling. How many times have you had something that was good taken away from you and you said, why on earth would that be taken away? It's the story of my call into the ministry and maybe you've heard it before. God had a lot of good things for us in my family and we were set up and then God took those things away and I thought, that's not fair. But then he provided something different, something better. Now, it's not easy to swallow those sorts of things. It wasn't easy for me at first, but it's only when we confess that our lives are not our own, and this is one of the hardest things to do. Our lives are not ours. Our lives belong to God, and it's only when we can confess that that instances like this begin, begin to make sense to us. And that's where abiding in Christ is key. In verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. Christ and our connection to him is what it's all about. Of course, we will be upset when everything goes wrong. Of course, because we are human and we are connected to what we want to how we see our lives going. It's only when we are connected to Christ, when we abide, when we remain in his will for our lives that all bumps in the road, all misfortunes, all devastating events in our world, all the times when our plans are turned upside down become opportunities, opportunities to share the grace of Christ. It's during those times that we are not going to be perfect because we're not perfect. I am certainly not perfect in those circumstances. Sometimes something happens to us and we fall apart and we don't know what to do and we don't know who to talk to and other times we're strong in those moments. But what would it mean to us 
to abide in Christ during those moments? What would it mean to remain in Him during those times in our lives? Because I would argue that those times are easier to deal with when we are abiding in Christ. It's during those times that God's protection and power are released to us. In verse 6 and 7, Jesus says, Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be given to you. My father grew up on a, on a farm, a dairy farm in northeastern Oklahoma. And when he was two, the farmhouse burned to the ground. And it was at night. It was an electrical fire and something that, that sparked uh, the fire. And my grandfather heard and smelled and, and saw it happen. And he got up and got everybody out of the house. And he picked up my two-year-old dad and carried him out of the house. And he sat him down beside him. And he said, stay there. Don't move. Stay here. And then he turned around and he made sure that everybody was there. My dad has five sisters and they're all older. And so he was counting heads and he was looking for his wife. And his father, my dad's grandfather, my great-great-grandfather was living with them on the farm and he made sure that he was there. And then he turned around and my dad was gone. (laughs) And the way my grandfather used to tell it, the way my dad tells it, is that he just thought, well, he must have gone to his mother I'm going to go around to the side and make sure that everything on the side of the house is cleared out and and this and that. And so he he walked around and then he remembered that he left his wallet in the house. (laughs) And he had like $10 in his wallet and, and some cards that had information on it and he needed it. So he rushes back into the burning house and he grabs his wallet and on the way out he passes my father's room and he's in his crib, laying in his crib because his crib is more comfortable than the the ground outside. It's warmer in the house. No one laughed at that in first service. So he grabs him out of the crib. I can't imagine what he was thinking. What are you doing? Grabs him and he takes him outside and he holds him in his arms until the house burns down, which means my life is worth $10. Ninety dollars with inflation. What a crazy story, right? An incredible story. Is this not the way God works in our lives? He is, first of all, in the building with us when it's burning down. I I didn't think about that until first service, and I thought, that's the first thing. He's there in the building with us. Then he takes us out of the building, and he sits us down, and he says, remain in me, abide in me, stay with me. And then we go back into the burning building because it's warmer in there. Because for some reason, it's more safe in a burning building than it is standing next to God, standing next to Christ. And then he does something amazing. He goes back into the building again. And he grabs us and he takes us outside and he holds us in his arms until it all burns down. Verse 6's example of the fire illustrates the kind of protection that we have while we remain in Christ and the kind of protection we don't have when we don't remain in Christ. Our Old Testament reading that Dave read for us earlier from Psalm 122 says, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Now, if we were Israelites and we were living 2,500 years ago and we were in Palestine, when we looked to the hills, we would see prostitution, shrines built to Baal and other fake gods. We would see drinking and merriment. We would see fake gods. It gives you a different perspective of that. Because I think about God and I think about looking up to the hills where God is. Now, God is everywhere. But as an Israelite, they would say, no, my God's not on that hill. My God is everywhere. My God is not the sun God. 
My God is not the moon God. My God is the God, the one who created the heavens and the earth. It means that we should be constantly asking ourselves, what does God want from me instead of what do I want from me? It means that we can do this by staying rooted to the word, by talking to God about, by ourselves, talking to God with others in worship and everywhere else and constantly thinking about how we can love one another, as it says in verse 12. One's protection comes from the Lord, not the hills where God's enemies were. And if we want protection, if we want to avoid being thrown out into the fire and burned, we must abide in Christ, remain in Christ, the one who offers protection and salvation. Now, as parents, we know it's easier to hold on to our kids when they're one and two, when they're infants, when they're not strong enough to run away from us, but there will come a time, and for many of us, that time has come when our kids grow up and we, as we ourselves have grown up, and they become strong enough or strong-willed enough to walk away. And maybe that doesn't describe your kids. Maybe that describes you. That described me at one point in my life. I became strong-willed enough to walk away, and I did. And praise be to God, God didn't let me. He let me go so far, and then he grabbed me out of the burning building, and he brought me back. And that's why Christ says, abide in me, because he knows the cost of those that don't. There are also times when the power of prayer can become connected to what we want rather than what God wants for us. This is why when we pray that prayer for a PlayStation 4 or a BMW 5 Series, <laughs> right, or that vacation house in Maui, for some reason it doesn't happen. <laughs> Wait, verse 7, anything you want, pray to me, I will give to you. What's happening there? And you may have been connected to God. You may have been removing the things that are dragging you into sin, looking, pursuing, and listening for God's will in your life, and then you ask God that your football team will win the Super Bowl, or you, in Sunday school, you may ask for a unicorn. We've gotten that from time to time. But have you ever play, prayed to God while at the same time abiding in Christ? Because those two things are clearly connected here in verse 7. And so being connected to Christ is knowing how to pray. Being connected to Christ is knowing how to pray. And Jesus gives us this great example of prayer. If you keep reading through chapter 17, there are 26, 27 verses of Jesus' prayer to his Father. And 25 of those verses are about his disciples and giving glory to his Father. And one verse Jesus takes for himself, one verse. And you know what he asks? That he be glorified through his obedience of death on the cross. <laughs> we are certainly not Jesus. That is not how we pray. Verse 13 says, No one has greater love than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. But here's my understanding of that. The cross isn't Jesus' way of saying to his disciples, this is how you do it. Because as soon as we do that, we're pointing back at ourselves. The cross is about Jesus. The cross is about what Jesus did to pay the ransom for our sin. The cross is about Jesus' sacrifice, which was made on our account, so that our standing before God could be fixed. It doesn't mean that everyone should start dying for each other. It means that that's what Jesus had to do for us. And no one could do that better than him. And that is the greatest love ever, ever given. Finally, what Jesus is saying to his disciples is all summed up in verse 16, and this is my favorite verse in this chapter. You did not choose me. I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Too many times I look to the hills. 
Too many times I abide and I remain in what makes me comfortable, what fulfills my current needs. Too many times I run back into the burning house thinking that it's safer than standing next to Jesus himself. Those things are often too too often places that are fruitless and promise that we have power and knowledge to do things for ourselves and that creeps into our understanding of salvation. Too many times I have chosen, I have thought that I have chosen God, that of all the paths that I could take in my life, I took the right path and I found God and I found his truth and I understand it when it was really the other way around. How many of you can understand that, can relate to that? Each and every one of us have been chosen by God, and as such, we have been assigned to do great things for him. And it begins with abiding in him, remaining in him, standing next to him. How will that change us? Let's pray. Dear Lord, I... We stand before you humbled because we are in your presence. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to abide in you, for the opportunity to be near you because of your spirit that dwells inside of us. Keep us close, Lord. And when we run away, because we will, we will run away. Follow us and bring us back. We thank you for your son. And it's his name, it's in his name we pray. Amen. We hope this service has been a blessing to you. We also invite you to join us to worship in person on Sunday mornings. We have services at 915 and 1115. Thank you for watching and may God bless you.